Hi, my name is Andromeda, my pronouns are she, they, and today we'll be discussing the trans history of Weimar Germany. As we discussed in the previous video on Magnus Hirschfeld, Hirschfeld coined the term transvestite in 1910 in his work Transvestites, the Erotic Drive to Crossdress. He argued that transvestism was a variation distinct from homosexuality. He believed these individuals to be acting in accordance with their nature, rather than against it, and that people may be born with a nature contrary to their assigned gender. He believed that in cases where the desire to live as the opposite sex was strong, that science should provide a means of transition. One soldier that Hirschfeld had been working with described wearing women's clothing as the chance to be a human being, at least for a moment. One of Magnus Hirschfeld's most profound contributions throughout his lifetime was the acknowledgement and validation of trans and gender nonconforming people. His work, The Intersexual Constitution, not only established the terminology transsexual, but also explained sexual variations that did not fit into binary sexual categories, acknowledging the profound variations in sex that the gender binary did not make room for. In his study, Sexual Transitions, he made the argument that, taken in very strong scientific terms, one is not able in this sense to speak of man and woman but on the contrary, only of people that are for the most part male, or for the most part female. The book gave visual examples of male bodies with rounded hips, and female bodies with small breasts. It further developed Hirschfeld's idea that we all begin life as one asexual creature, only then to develop various sexual characteristics after being exposed to hormones and physical maturation. Everyone experiences this development in unique ways, however, and consequently we all represent slightly different mixtures of these various sexual characteristics. To put it in other terms, there is no absolute male or absolute female. This is a concept that resembles our understanding of sex today. Hirschfeld was also active in advocating for trans individuals on legal fronts. In 1909, he convinced local authorities in Berlin to experiment with transvestite passes that enabled men and women to cross-dress in public without the worry of being arrested for disorderly conduct or being harassed by the police in other ways. In making his case, he discovered that there was some public sympathy for these individuals, since a series of newspaper reports and books had recently reported on the difficulties that they faced. In addition to providing his patients with transvestite passes, he also helped his patients to get legal name changes. These were made possible by the attitudes towards scientists and other professionals at the time, in which it was understood that they had much more authority and experience behind their words and actions. Hirschfeld also established the Institute for Sexual Science, which is often regarded as the world's first trans clinic. At the Institute for Sexual Science, Magnus Hirschfeld and his associates would perform the first gender-affirming surgeries, housing famous patients such as Dora Richer and Lily Elby. In 1910, Arthur Kronfeld began the first ever sex reassignment surgery, Afraid that their 23-year-old patient might commit suicide if it was not done, they performed the first male-to-female sex reassignment surgery. The institute was often regarded as a homely place, and five trans women who had difficulty supporting themselves with work after surgery were employed there. Queer urban scenes also actively made space for trans individuals. Many of the chief attractions in Germany at the time were the transvestite venues. By far the most famous was the El Dorado, a nightclub whose festive atmosphere attracted not only homosexuals, 
but artists, authors, celebrities, and tourists wanting to admire a piece of decadent Berlin, or catch a glimpse of someone famous. By the mid-1920s, though, the most popular gay nightclub in the city was the Sleeping Beauty, a transvestite cabaret with entertainment provided by Tilla and Resi. Tilla became well known for her Salome number, whereas Resi did a flamenco-style Carmen dance that attracted visitors from miles around. And then there were the tables, each one featuring a private telephone, as the film cabaret depicts, that could be used to call men sitting at neighboring tables to ask them to dance. As mentioned in the previous video on the lesbian history of Weimar Germany, lesbian magazines were different from many other queer publications and periodicals, in that they self-consciously addressed a second audience, male transvestites, who were not necessarily assumed to be homosexual. They printed essays on transvestite issues that discussed both male and female varieties. They included letters from male transvestite readers who asked questions and contributed to ongoing discussions. The meaning of transvestism itself, coined by Hirschfeld in 1910, is debated by some. As Katie Sutton observes, this term was understood in a Hirschfeldian sense as going beyond cross-dressing, to encompass other aspects of gender identity that would today be understood under the banner of transgender. For a time, in fact, Girlfriend included a special supplement of transvestism, which in 1930 was briefly and unsuccessfully expanded into its own magazine, entitled The Third Sex. One of the most famous lesbians of the time, Lot Ham, who owned several lesbian bars in Berlin, and was featured frequently in many of the lesbian magazines of the era, even identified as a transvestite. And in 1929, she helped establish a transvestite group for men and women called Dion. It is unclear the extent to which Ham's self-identification matches our understanding of trans identities today, however her self-identification and advocacy for trans individuals is yet another example of the ties which form between the lesbian and trans communities of the time. In the next video, we'll discuss queer urban scenes in Weimar Germany in more detail, exploring the vibrant queer culture which formed during the era. Thank you for watching, I hope you learned some valuable queer history, and I'll see you in the next video.